Welcome to Spirit Matters. This is Phil Goldberg on behalf of me and my co-host, Dennis Ramundi. We're on hiatus now in uh, the summer of 2022. So we're posting some interviews I recorded with leading spiritual teachers last year. They were part of a special series on Unity Online Radio under the title of my book, Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times. I'm sure you'll find them illuminating and inspiring. Enjoy. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Welcome to Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world. You can have inner peace and clarity even in the midst of chaos. Welcome to Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times with Phil Goldberg. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this special series of programs, which just happens to have the same title as my latest book. Our goal is to bring you expert advice and guidance for remaining spiritually secure and strong, able to find joy and the blessings of life, even in the most challenging times, not just this unprecedented pandemic, but any time you're hit by the trials and tribulations of our crazy world. Every episode features a wise, compassionate, experienced, spiritual teacher representing a broad range of traditions and paths. I encourage you to listen closely, write down the ideas that resonate with you, because there'll be many of them, and you'll be able to develop an inventory to draw from when you need a spiritual boost and a way to reconnect with our divine source. Because we all have within us a sanctuary of peace, fortress of strength, not something we have to find or build, but something already present at the core of our being as our truest, deepest, highest self. It's our essence and all the practices from all the spiritual traditions have the purpose of reun reuniting us or awakening us to what we truly are eternal beings with an earthly curriculum to help us realize our highest possibilities. And the more we connect with that infinite reality, the better equipped we are to face our challenges and take action to make the world a little less crazy. That said, let me introduce today's guest. I'm very happy to have with us Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith, He's the founder and spiritual director of Agape International Spiritual Center, a transdenominational community in Los Angeles, a world-renowned speaker who's appeared on many major media outlets from Oprah to My Little Podcast. He's the author of award-winning books such as Life Visioning and Spiritual Liberation, and a wise soul with much to offer all of us. Welcome, Reverend Michael. Brother Phil, it's good to, good to be with you again. And your podcast is not a little podcast. It touches, <laughs> it touches, the quality of it touches many, many people. And I'm glad to be with you again. Great. Thank you. Let's begin with a, a personal question. Um, how have you adapted to the uh, conditions that were imposed on us by the pandemic this last year. And did your personal response to it surprise you in any way? Well, you know, we're about a year since uh, this thing began. And I can remember I was just arriving back from India right when the, uh, the lockdown was, was occurring. And so I was able to get in on one of the last flights that was out of that particular country. And I was supposed to be taking off for a period of time. But what happened was I obviously stayed, you know, I didn't go anywhere. I didn't uh, take a sabbatical. I didn't take a vacation. 
I just basically began to 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 work a little bit more in order to provide a sense of solace and peace and inspiration to people who were, you know, basically being caught by the biggest virus, which is the virus of fear. Mm. And so um, my response didn't surprise me. It surprised me that, you know, everything that I had planned in terms of taking some some long needed time off didn't happen. But my response in terms of what I did with the community, I turned all the ministries into online ministries from our uh, pastoral care programs, our university, our prayer ministry, uh, daily prayers, daily meditations. We turned everything, in, including the Sunday services, which were already online, uh, to an online community. And I, I gave my staff like a week to do it, I, I, you know, an enviable task. I really made them work harder than, than they should have. But uh, we got it together and have been serving uh, continuously since that moment. So um, I, I guess my only surprise was just the, um, was just the lockdown that what was imposed. That was surprising. But our response to it was not surprising. You know. Yeah. Now, agape... Uh, on uh, Sundays especially, is a, an electrifying kind of place. And people um, are used to being together in spiritual community at, at, the, at Agape. Um, how different was it? How difficult was it for people to adapt to the online offering instead? And how difficult was it for you to not have that same uh, juice uh, coming from the, the congregation. You know, once I did the very first service, then after that, I, I had completely adjusted. And my particular uh, way of teaching is that I, I don't really draw anything from the audience. I teach myself to draw from the source and to give to the audience. So mm. my particular way of working with people is not like an entertainer. I think I think entertainers basically draw their energy a lot from the audience. If the audience is big and clapping and things like that, an entertainer can can tap into that energy. That's never really been my te technique. My technique has always been coming from meditation. So I would come from the meditation and have my connection and then speak from that. And of course, if there's an audience there, I imagine it is multiplied a little bit. So there wasn't that much adjustment for me, and people were, I, th I think people were kind of surprised that I still got up and did three services with the same kind of energy that I would do if people were in the sanctuary. Mm. And, and so that, that wasn't much, much of an adjustment. But I think the congregation, you know, in the beginning um, had to adjust. You know, we had many people write us and uh, email and text saying, things like, well, we're never going to take agape for granted again. You know, mm. we come like every other week or once a month or, you know, now that we can't come, you know, we, we really want to be there, you know. So we got a lot of letters and, and uh, uh, correspondence basically saying they're not taking the community for granted anymore. But the other thing that happened, and I called it the corona, one of the things I call was the corona bonus is that we were already online, but the online viewership just skyrocketed. Mm. One, during one six month period, we had an additional million people view us. And mm. we received a lot of, um, the, the, the key word that people were saying was things like, wow, finally a voice of sanity in all of these crazy times. Wow. I, 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 I had lost my place in peace. I had lost my peace of mind based on the mass media and all the fear that was being propagated. Well, I'm, I'm finally getting back to my source by listening. So I think that once the congregation adjusted and could come online and watch it, they began to tell their friends, they began to tell their friends, and then it just jumped borders until it became very, very international. It was already international, but it just kind of um, magnified that particular, that particular way of communication. Interesting. We should, uh, as long as you mentioned it, let people know that the um, they can find you at agapelive.com. Um, yes. And uh, and the services are being streamed, and there's lots of other things on uh, on the website that 
you all will find of value. Michael, one of the things that's always uh, so uh, wonderful about Agape uh, services is the music and the camaraderie of the people. You had to do without that. How, how did the people find uh, compensate for that? With, with two things occurred. One, we still kept the music. Oh. You know, we we they, we had the the obviously the social distancing on stage and things of that particular nature. Well, we, we continued with the music, and then we had some, a lot of our great artists who were not necessarily Los Angeles based. They would um, send us video, ah. and, we, and we would send it. So, and then uh, Marianne Lewis, who is our music and arts minister, she became very creative. Uh, it, 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 she learned skills that she didn't have before, before uh, the coronavirus hit. And she learned how to bring the choir together on Zoom, uh, pick out the voices, arrange, working with editors, working with sound engineers, so that when these people sang, even though they were recording from their own homes, on their own iPhones, when, hmm. it, when it went across the screen, it carried a magnitude of joy and camaraderie and fellowship. Uh, that was the same magnitude of what was happening when they were all recording together in different locations. So oh. for, for her, she didn't know how to do all those things before the before this hit. So it, it just uh, uh, up-leveled her skill level. So now we have a combination of individuals that are on the stage live and intermixing with people that are in Chicago and New York and uh, uh, South Africa. We have Miss Lyra, that, that's a great, the great South African artist uh, that sings for us. And she, she records in her recording studio right there in South Africa and sends us the, the song for the service. So I think what has happened is the skill level of people went up. I think in the beginning, you, people may have experienced some frustration but, you know, whenever something like this happens, then it's a call for innovativeness, resourcefulness, and creativity. And I think, that's, I think that's what's happened in our community, just across the board. I mean, uh, uh, crisis counseling, things like that. Uh, uh, my, my staff, uh, Reverend Coco, from the uh, one from the Heart Ministry, grew to help put that ministry on Zoom so that people who are in crisis uh, didn't didn't feel left out because they couldn't see a person in person, you see. And so it, it's a, it's adaption. You know, we have to yeah. learn to adapt. Very good. That's a good segue to some practical advice for people. It sounds like there were hidden blessings in it, uh, in addition to uh, the absence of parking issues. At, uh... <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got one co parking complaint <laughs> in a whole year. <laughs> Um, you, you mentioned earlier uh, fear. Um, I was going to ask you what the biggest challenges that uh, your constituents have uh, had to face during the pandemic. Uh, is fear the most important? I think fear, is, the, fear uh, the virus of the mind is fear. And I think fear is... Prob probably trumps everything that we're facing. Because fear, particularly if it's just a, a, a attached to no solution, um, it compromises the immune system. It um, brings about a level of toxification in the body temple. It um, makes the hemispheres of the brain no longer communicate with each other. So your critical thinking and your intuition and your wisdom and your guidance and your discernment begin to fail. You know, I still believe, as one of the presidents once said, you know, there's nothing to fear but fear itself, you know. And, mm -hmm. and so I think the congregation had to grow out of just being fearful and beginning to understand that these spiritual principles that we teach, they do work. <laughs> you know, Johnny Coleman used to say, they work if you work them. You know, <laughs> if there's a dimension of spiritual practice, you, you can basically... Um, obviously have your immune system strong through spiritual practice. And then you also have a level of wisdom and guidance that you can begin to hear directly from your soul. And so you're able to navigate through these uh, constant changing 
um, edicts that we have to, to move through, but you do so with the spirit of knowing that you're not alone, that the spirit of God is with you, that uh, the spirit of wisdom is with you. It didn't disappear because a virus showed up, you know, uh, nothing disappeared because a virus showed up. It means that we're to amplify our spiritual practice, not diminish it, you see. And so I think, um, and people spoke to this also. People spoke to the fact that they had gotten, you know, many people still to this day speak to the fact that they would gotten caught up in the fear loop. They'd gotten caught up in the fear cycle. And, um, and some of the fear cycle was um, uh, bigger, you know, had become much more magnified. And when they came back to themselves, then they're able to discern what is it that's right for them to do, you know, to take care of themselves, to protect themselves and their family. You know, one of the questions, and I, I, I went over that question again this past Sunday, but when this first started, I remember last March, I said to the congregation, listen, the question you want to ask yourself is who do I want to become as I grow this through this particular uh, national, international, and global crisis? What do I want to become? Now, that'll keep you on the edge of transformation, that question, the edge of real change, not staying in fear and survival. Well, how am I to grow through this? And I think I revisited that question on Sunday, reminding people that we've gone through this a year now. You know, what, what have you become? Where have you grown? What talents have emerged? What new skills have emerged? You know, what depths of compassion and kindness have emerged from you during this time where people, you know, people need help, people need assistance. Have we grown in kindness? Have we grown in compassion? Or have we fallen, have we fallen prey to hate? and haters, and, uh, you know, uh, separation, you know, we have to, we have to keep in mind these particular qualities, you know. What are some of the primary practices that um, you drew upon or, or taught or led people to, uh, uh, and were they different in emphasis because of, of the pandemic? Yeah, there was some, some, some difference in emphasis. I mean, obviously, my, my primary practice is meditation that leads into affirmative prayer. Then, of course, there's the, the life visioning process and the, the pranayama, the breath work that I do. But I would have people on a regular basis tap into what I call the mystic cord of memory and have them remember moments in their life where they were, one, at peace, Two, all their needs were met. Or three, felt very safe. Just remember the feeling of those things. And then I would work with them to amplify those particular feelings and then teach them that those particular feelings, that particular connection, has nothing to do with an external circumstance, that they can actually engender the awareness of peace and safety uh, and the feeling tone of all needs met without anything changing the external world, I would have them amplify that and then come back to that on a regular basis so that they begin to develop a new baseline of where they're living from. They're not living from happiness that's derived from something good that happened in the world. They're, de they're, they're living in a state of happiness or peace that's derived from their own intrinsic nature. And then through spiritual practice, they're able to sustain it. Now, what does that provide? That provides living from insight and wisdom and direction from your soul rather than trying to lean on an external reporter or somebody in mass media, some external authority figure, which can take you down some very interesting paths. You're, you're beginning to rely on your own soul faculty to guide you and direct you to take care of you. It's better. It's the good news. <laughs> it's, it's better than anything outside of yourself. And so I, so, I, so I really probably emphasize and still too, still too to this day, you know, bringing people back to the mystic cord of memory, staying there, stabilizing yourself there, and then coming back to that when you, when you fall back into the world of experience again. Very good advice. Uh, you developed a technique called life visioning and wrote a book about it. 
Can you tell us about it and how it might help people deal with uh, challenging times in their lives? I think that the life visioning process is very powerful because it's transformational in nature, but it's the next stage after um, visualization. You know, in the metaphysical movement, individuals cut their teeth on learning how to visualize and see particular outcomes they want to experience and things of that particular nature. But oftentimes people forget that there's a destiny already within us, that there's a soul call. There's something about us that's unique and unrepeatable that we're here to deliver. Just as within the seed of, of, a, of a rose, uh, uh, a bush, let's say, uh, there's a distinct individual rose bush that will arise out of that particular seed and proliferate other rose bushes. So within us, there's the seed of the Christ, there's the seed of the Buddha mind, there's the seed of the Zoroaster consciousness, there's the seed of, of, of enlightenment and, and excellence, according, and it's unique. So the vision process takes off where visualizing leaves off. It, it, it asks different questions. It's saying in substance that there's something already about me that's unique. What is it? I want it to emerge. I want to know what it is. I want to yield to it. I want to articulate it. I want to walk in that direction. So it's very transformational because many people are dangling on the strings of a puppet of some societal status quo or a parental fantasy or a religious superstition, and they're not even in tune with their own soul's destiny, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so the vision process brings people to an awareness that there's something about every individual that's magnificent and brilliant, and we're seeking to catch that vision and, and feel our way into it. It's a, you know, a five-step process. And, and, um, and release ourselves to it so that we're really growing and evolving every year to a, a next great vision and version of ourself rather than living primarily and just trying to protect the little self or to survive you know, in the world, which is, you know, sometimes people become very stagnant in that, and stagnation and hell are synonymous. So people end up being the same person that they were a year ago, which is not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not good. If we're the same person we were the same time last year, you know, that's stagnation and that's a living hell. Especially this last year. Yes. Uh, <laughs> how, does, uh, how does prayer enter in, Michael? In your, in your new thought tradition, uh, what is the approach to prayer and how does it fit in here? Prayer is fundamental and everyone prays in the evolution of prayer is based, everyone prays based on their concept of God. So in the old days, and it's still, it's still around a little bit today, you know, people had God as some kind of external deity way up in the sky that was capricious, that had chosen people and could condemn people to heaven and hell and things of that particular nature. And so people, from if, if that was your concept of God, then people would beg or beseech this reluctant deity for favor. But we've evolved now, and we understand now that I like to call God the presence that's never an absence. Mm. It's, it's always here. God is always here. It's a, it's, it's, as Jesus said, you know, God is spirit with a capital S. We must worship God in spirit and in truth. So in the New Thought, Ageless Wisdom tradition, we enter into fields of gratitude and we, we open ourselves up to recognize this presence through spiritual practice, to feel our oneness with the presence, not far off. It's right here. Jesus said, closer than your breathing, nearer than your hands and feet. The Quran says, God is closer to you than your neck vein. You know, so it's, it's, we're, we're at one with God. And then from our sense of oneness, we speak the word for whatever is appearing to be lacking in our life. We speak the word to have a realization that what's appearing to be lacking is already here. And, and then we, of course, come back to a deep sense of thanksgiving and then we, we go into a state of release and letting go without an attachment to an outcome, and then you know, go through our day 
you know, coming back to that kind of awareness, either through the use of affirmation or mindfulness or meditation. So prayer is not beseeching. It's not begging. It's not pleading. You know, it's actually seeking to have contact with conscious contact, because we're never separated. Conscious contact with the presence and then having a realization that what we what we think is lacking, we already have it. You see. Mm. Annie Lamott, the writer, said there are three prayers, help, thanks, and wow. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, I tell you something. That's, you know, I tell you something. That's right. When I, a couple of years ago, I was in um, Costa Rica, and I got caught up in this riptide. And it was one of those swirling riptides that would go side to side. So if you swam to one side to try to get out of it, it would hit you from the other side. And I was deep in the ocean. I didn't realize I had gotten that far out. And I was exhausted and I couldn't get in. And I, I remember going uh, uh, underwater, swallowing a lot of water. And I remember having a deep sense of peace that if this was my last day on the planet, I was very peaceful. I, I, had, I didn't, I wasn't, wasn't fa fearful. But then it's, this thought went across my mind you know, my daughter was on the beach waiting for me. I said, people are going to be very upset if I don't make it back, you know? <laughs> I popped up, and I programmed my mind. I just did a program. I said, regardless of how tired the body gets, regardless of how tired the body gets. Go ahead. Sorry. Keep going. I just did a program. Regardless of how tired the body gets, keep going. Then when I popped up, the words, these words came out of my mouth. Help. I need some help here. Just like uh -huh. that. I didn't do it. It wasn't conscious. It was just, it just came out of my mouth. Help. I need some help here. And then there was like a quiet. And then the, this wave came and it gave me momentum. The second wave came, gave me more momentum. Third wave came, gave me more momentum. And I had this momentum. It still took me a long time to get in, but I never gave up. But I finally got in. I was exhausted, you see. And I named help, hello, eternal, loving presence. That became what? my acronym for help. Wonderful. Know? And I added it to my spiritual practice. That we, that's a good segue. We have to take a short break. We'll come back to thanks and wow <laughs> in a minute. We'll be right back. Discover the power within. Unity Online Radio. The voice of an awakening world. Welcome back to Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times with your host, Phil Goldberg. Welcome back. We're here with Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith. He was just telling us a fabulous story about uh, his um, escape from drowning. Uh, and you, you mentioned that you turned HELP into the acronym. Would you repeat it for us? Yes, it's Hello, Eternal Loving Presence. Now, I've added that to my spiritual practice. I, I have a friend in Los Angeles, and she's uh, like a world famous medium. She's a good buddy of mine. And I told her what had happened to me in uh, Costa Rica. And she said, do you mind if I take a peek and look and see what happened to you? I said, no, go ahead. So she said, oh, you, you asked for help. I hadn't told anybody this. She mm. said, you asked for help. Mm. I said, yes. She said, she said, the moment you asked for help, an archangel gave you three waves and assisted you. And she reminded me that you, the, your, your angelic realm and your ancestral realm cannot assist you unless you ask for help. They cannot intervene in your life unless you ask for help. So today, I will, you're asking me about prayer. I described it, but then I always add, and, and please help me. Mm. Know, I'm, and now help makes me vulnerable and open to something that's beyond my present paradigm so that I'm available to the presence of God, I'm available to any kind of assistance that wants to come, spiritual guides, aids, help for seen and unseen, angelic realm, ancestral realm. I just ask, I, I just say, I, I, and I need a little help here. <laughs> so it keeps me open. Hello, eternal loving presence. 
That's great. And, and, and that's different from what you described before about beseeching God no, for, no, for no, a favor. No beseeching. It's more vulnerability and availability. Mm. You know, and if, if people, if you don't accept help from people, sometimes you can't move forward. You know, we, we, we live in a community and we're, we, we, we support each other. We love each other. We pray for each other. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we assist each other, but one must be open to receive love and, and assistance. And that's so, what I was yeah. going to ask you about the, the receptivity of it. There, there's, there's that old joke about the, the guy who's in the boat and, and he prays to God for help and, right. and, he keep, and one thing after another happens and finally God says, hey, I sent you a boat, I sent you a life raft, I've sent you a helicopter. You know, you, you, what were you waiting for? <laughs> and, you weren't receptive. It, you were it didn't not. come to you the way you thought it should come. <laughs> right. Do you run into that with people? Oh, oh yeah, I think that... Um... When I, you know, I, I used to counsel all the time. Uh, I did that as a full time. That was my full time. I was a spiritual therapist for seven, eight years of my life, and uh, I saw six, eight people every single day as a as a practitioner. And one of the things I had to work with people on was receptivity. Mm-hmm. Um, I call it getting agreement. And so I would work with people. I mean, I worked I, as an example. I worked with an individual beginning probably six, eight months ago. A friend of my daughter's, well, friend, f- family friend who had um, stage four cancer, and um, and I remember going to see her, and I said to her, and the doctors had already written her off and said she wouldn't be alive for th- three, four weeks or whatever, and I said, I said, first of all, do you do you still want to live with this body? Do you do you want to be here? And she said yes, and I said, I needed agreement from you, I I I, yeah, I need you to agree with me that this is possible. And that you're receptive, and then once I got the agreement, I, I went to work, you know. But I, I, I because I had to, I had to break down all of the naysayer within her that she had gotten from the, the medical tradition, that mm-hmm. they, you know, they have to give it, you know, by law they have to say certain things. But I got an agreement, and I got receptivity from her. Then I was able to work with her. And uh, today, you know, the doctors call her their stage four miracle. You know, she's mm. she's, she's fine. She's beautiful. Um, but yeah, I would, I would get agreement get, and I t- try to keep people just be receptive. We're not looking for wishful thinking. We're not looking for a magic bullet. You know, it's real inner work to actually be receptive and to even look at the blocks within ourselves where we push away good, push away love, push away, you know, because we don't feel deserving or we have a little, little bit of self-loathing or we have some kind of guilt about something we did or didn't do in life, you know? So we have to kind of work through that so that we're living in a state of receptivity. I like to say receptivity to more good than we've ever imagined, you see. Mm. Wonderful. Um, we talked earlier about fear um, and at the same time, it occurs to me, uh, especially this last year, there are people who are seriously hurting and, and people who uh, can't feed their children, people who've lost their jobs pe- and homes, people who are in debt. Um, those are realities and they invoke <clears throat> fears and concerns that are, you know, legitimate and, and, and real. And I'm sure there are members of your uh, congregation and in your circle who are in that category. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you deal with them as opposed to the, those of us who are lucky enough to sort of treat the pandemic as a sabbatical and a time of introspection? Well, for, uh, for, first of all, as a community, we up level our tithing to organizations that were working with individuals who had either lost jobs or needed food. We partnered with an organization here in Los Angeles that uh, gave a, gave away food and clothing. So we so so practically, we began to um, have collaborations with organizations that actually do that better than what we could do it as a community. Mm. People that were already on the ground doing that kind of work. So the the the, the, the food banks and other organizations, we would support that. And we would also invite our, our congregation, if possible, based on COVID restrictions, you know, to volunteer at those, mm-hmm. those places. 
Um, so that's a very that's that's practical, you know. And we still we're still doing, still doing that to this day. I mean, every every uh, every week we're looking for an organization to support that's mm. uh, doing great work um, in in that area as well as other areas as well. Domestic violence, uh, newly f- individuals who've been um, freed from sexual slavery. You know, we work with uh, organizations that support them. Um, even We even support organizations that are planting trees because we do need trees to mm-hmm. live. Planting. Yes. We don't need trees. We're gone, buddy. You know that. Yes, but um, I do. So, so, so that's the practical. And then what I try to teach the congregation is that I remind them that they're being bombarded with worst-case scenarios that are happening to people we know and people we don't know. And we, we have to be aware of what's happening on the planet so that we grow a strong, compassionate muscle, a kindness muscle, and a muscle that allows us where we can and when we can, you know, to assist in, in those particular areas. But then we have to do inner work where we begin to develop best case scenarios in our own mind about our own life, the life of our family, and the life of our global family. So we're not just carrying these pictures of doom and gloom that we get on a regular basis from mass media, we have to have pictures in our own awareness of best possible scenarios so that we become prone to guidance and direction that moves us in that direction. So an untrained mind generally gets caught up in a worst case scenario and ends up as William Shakespeare said that a coward dies a thousand deaths, Mm. you know, People like are always worried and anxious and anxious and worried about the worst case scenario. And we're not saying that worst case scenarios do not happen, but for many people it doesn't happen, but they're living it energetically anyway. Mm. So I'm inviting people to get to start to create best case scenarios for humanity, for ourselves, how we're going to grow through this, find out what we can do and it, as individuals to support people that are less fortunate than us and create best case scenarios. This is this is all work though. This is not like happy talk or a theory. I mean, we have to actually do it. <laughs> yeah. You know. Speaking of which, um, one of the beautiful things uh, about Agape has always been uh, the diversity of the congregation. Um, it's, it's kind of the exception to that old saying that Sunday morning's the most segregated time in, in American life because of the church segregation. Uh, Agape is amazingly diverse. And so here we're in a time that people have called a racial reckoning, a time of uh, where uh, racial and economic uh, inequities are in in the forefront of, of our concerns and things like police violence uh, is, uh, very common. What would you, as a, a the presider of uh, a, a diverse congregation like that in, in a diversity like L.A., and as someone who grew up African-American in L.A., what would you like people to know about these issues from a spiritual point of view? Yeah, well, well first of all, you know, Agape is in his 35th year. And when we began to do the life visioning process to allow agape to emerge, it was in our, 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 our vision DNA to be a diverse and inclusive community. My vision core itself was, was diverse in terms of uh, uh, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. You know, every, everybody was in the room. And so from the beginning, it became just a part of our DNA Because one of the things that emerged in the vision process was we wanted to to be an example of the next stage of human evolution. Now, those were big words 36 years ago. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Next stage of human evolution. I mean, that kind of, those words get bandied about a lot now, you know, conscious evolution and and that. But 35, 36 years ago, you know, that, that, that wasn't, that vocabulary wasn't as highly used. So in our DNA, we wanted to represent that. Mm. And in 1988, I think I was the first minister in Los Angeles to actually uh, officiate a same-sex wedding, you huh. know, before it was legal. So, and we had a, obviously we had a, um, 
uh, LGBTQT ministry emerge uh, at, the, at the second or third year of our community as well. So we've always been on the cutting edge of inclusivity, diversity and inclusivity. So I think uh, my, one of my teachers was a Dr. Howard Washington Thurman. Mm. And uh, I stayed in Thurman Hall when I went to Morehouse College. I met Dr. Thurman. I studied his works. One of the statements he said was, to say that you love humanity is an abstract statement. Humanity has a body. Humanity has an ethnicity. Humanity breathes. You cannot say you love humanity in, in, if, if you do not love the individuals around you, regardless of color of skin, sexual orientation, you know, religious background, whatever, whatever that can, can separate us. So I, that was a great influence on my own psyche that uh, you, you're not going to learn about each other if you're not around each other, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was a part of our vision so that I think because of that, everyone came, you know. And I, I can remember pre-COVID when we'd be in the hallway, you know, like you said, it was very, you know, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of people hugging and talking, you know, for long periods of time we would hear so many different languages, mm. you know, the, the, the Slavic languages, the Spanish, you know, German, you know, uh, people from all over the world, the Japanese, Chinese, uh, of course, English, you know, because people were from all over the world celebrating life with us. And a lot of the, the, the old timers who were there with me from almost the beginning, we would just smile because here was the vision, you know, all, all these different kinds of people worshiping and celebrating together. Not to say there's not challenges. I mean, we've had, um, you know, community gatherings and meetings and all manner of things so that people will become sensitive to other cultures, mm -hmm. you know, genders, uh, uh, sexual orientations. I mean, there's been times where people inadvertently offended each other because they didn't know that in one culture what was appropriate was inappropriate in another culture, you know. Yeah. So, but unless you're around each other, you can't work it out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so we've been working it out for almost 35 years. And of course, when a lot of the uh, upheaval took place recently, you know, we, 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 we've been working out even more. You know, um, one of our great practitioners here, Asia Mason, and a and, and number of practitioners, and I'm, I'm singling her out because she was the main facilitator, you know, we had community meetings, gatherings, people sharing their emotions and feelings. And, and we even had a class in the university that dealt with, you know, seeking to become the beloved community and dealing with these particular issues. It was not an easy class. Hmm. You know, people had biases. They had uh, blockages. They had blind spots. And, but they were in the class, obviously, because they wanted to work it out. You know, so uh, I think... It's, it's a part of our DNA, and it's a great experiment, and it's working, and uh, it's sometimes challenging. That's reassuring to know that in a city like L.A., in a place like Agape, there's still those kind of challenges, which I think should be hopeful to people who live in less diverse places where the opportunities to, to meet people who are different from you are more limited. It is a, a challenging time uh, in that regard, and I'm, I thank you for that insight. Uh, I know also that uh, climate change and the environment uh, are very important issues to you, um, and you, you speak of us becoming good stewards of Mother Earth. Um, what would you advise people, what would you urge people to do regarding uh, the planet? Well, at this important time, a couple of things. One, I like to remind people that a half of their pulmonary instrument is in trees. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when, when half of it's there. I mean, we have a symbiotic relationship with nature. What we breathe out, the foliage, the trees, the flowers breathe in. What they breathe out, we breathe in. So half of our pulmonary system is in nature. So to, to be disconnected from foliage and trees, you know, is absurd because if there's not enough, we don't exist. 
So, you know, we also support an organization that plants trees. We support two organ so far two organizations that plant trees, you know, because that's very important to us. You mm. know, the rainforest is diminishing. You know, uh, people are, are, you know, corporations are cutting down trees and uh, not just for lumber, but to find more ground to feed cows, you know, uh, stuff that people could eat. Uh, uh, and it's, and it's, it's, it's like we're like killing ourselves, you know, for, for the, the addiction of the, over the overeating of, of meat byproducts. We're killing ourselves for this. We're killing. And, and so I would say people, you know, fall in love with Mother Nature and ask how you can help. You can probably plant a tree in your backyard right now. Mm. You know, some flowers, a bush, or you can support organizations that do that as their particular dharma. You know, you look at the ocean uh, and the, all, the amount of plastic that's in the ocean and a lot of the pollution that's killing uh, the seaweed and the plankton. Um, we can do things about it. You know, it seems like the, the, the issues are so big that one person can't make a difference. But if every one person did something, it would make a big difference. And then, you know, always, you know, a, a lot of times in our community, we will stop in our, during our prayer moments of the community and we'll, we'll embrace the earth in prayer and, and, and actually hold the space for Mother Earth. Uh, it's my belief that Mother Earth is alive. You know, it's not an inert situation, uh, a deathless, uh, uh, excuse me, a lifeless ball of dirt. You know, Earth is yeah. a living being. She, she's, she's alive and her frequency is very high. And we want to lift our frequency to match the frequency of the earth so that uh, we can live in a much higher order of being. So I, I, so I try to teach the symbiotic relationship between all of this so you don't just get so metaphysically minded that you're not involved with the earth. You know, you're not involved mm -hmm. with, as you said, being a good steward, you know, uh, of, of, of the planet. I mean, because, you know, at the end of the day, if we go, if, if this experiment called spiritual being having human incarnation, if we destroy ourselves, um, Earth is still going to be here. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> she, she will grow. And the more, yeah. there'll be more trees. Yeah, I mean, you saw what happened in the major cities when we couldn't, couldn't drive. Pollution disappeared very yeah. shortly. People in India saw the Him Him Himalayas for the first time. People in China saw their sky for the first time in years. Yeah. And, and uh, the rain that was coming down didn't have all the acidic in it. And, and the earth was renewing itself just when people just stayed in their house for a period of time. So the earth is going to be okay, but are we? I'm glad that you emphasize the tree planting. Uh, like you, I was in India when the pandemic broke out, and I had met a number of spiritual leaders there who, whose uh, seva, service project, or one of them was planting trees in India, which needs them as much as we do here. Um, so, yes, please, everybody, plant trees. And if you live in places like Manhattan, go to Central Park and see if you can get some more trees there. Um, Michael, do you see any positive signs arising in the midst of the crises where we've been wallowing in for the last year? What lessons do you think we as a, as a, com a, co a human community uh, are learning or can learn from all this? I, 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 I'll, I'll, there's two levels to, to that. Uh, uh, one, you know, I think there is some good news. I, I do see people becoming... Uh, more uh, a combination of more introspective, particularly because since this lasted a long time. I'm not denying the fact that there are people that went through and are going through some mental and emotional changes and uh, things of that particular nature. But I do see a great number of people coming into seeking to discover who they are spiritually in big numbers. People are starting to ask different questions based on the uh, global crisis that we're facing. And then uh, two things occurred for me. One was, um, I imagine about two months ago today, and one was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, I was in meditation. I had a vision, and I could see the, the fog and the smog, the fog and the clouds that were blocking the sun. And I could see that, that fog of fear and anxiety and anxiousness 
over everything that's going on, but it wasn't hampering the sun at all. And in this vision, the perception shifted and the sun was shining very brightly and it was letting me know that life wins, uh, sun isn't diminishing, life isn't diminishing, people are blotting it out. And, and I said, and what came to me was that fog, the word fog meant forgetting omnipresent God or omnipresent good. You know, the fog mm -hmm. that was there and, and the clouds were there. And it just, it just left me with this awareness that, yeah, there's all kinds of things going on down on the planet. But there's something that's unalterable and it's going to win. It's going to shine. It's going to have the final word. And then two months ago, I was sitting right where I'm sitting now in my office, and I was about to do a Zoom uh, interview. And I do, whenever I'm about to do something, I always sit and meditate. So I went to my couch, and I sat down uh, to meditate for a few moments before the, before the Zoom class. And when I opened my eyes, Phil, I, I was blind. I couldn't see. I couldn't see mm. in front of me. And uh, I was, it, it, all that was around me was light. The light was so bright that I couldn't see anything else. So I called in uh, Reverend Kathleen McNamara and Lee Brown. I said, I can't, I can't see. At first, I was, I was, you know, about 30 seconds, I was nervous. I said, I can't see, I've gone blind. And um, so Lee called and said, we have, we're gonna have to delay that. Um, I, you know, there's a little emergency here. And, um, and then what I could see was I was engulfed by this light. And when I looked at Kathleen and Lee, I could see this fountain of light inside of their being and I knew that was them, that they weren't that body. They were that light. And it is true, it's not metaphorical, that we are the light, the light that shines, that, that light that shines through every man, every woman that comes into the planet, you see. And, and it left me with a residue. And then you know, after, after about 20, 30 minutes, I was able to see in, 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 in this dimension again. But it left me with this residue of, you know, we're all, we're all we're light beings. These, when we say that we're light beings, it's not metaphor, it's not prose, it's not just good poetry, you know? It's really truth. And, and, and if we could stop on a regular basis and extract our attention from the world of effects and the fear and the doubt and the worry, just temporarily bracket that and just ask to see who we are individually and collectively. Just open oneself up. I think the great reckoning that we're all involved in right now will give birth to the next level of humanity. Uh, and and I, I, this is all in my frequency, it's in my vibration, you know? I, I can't unsee what I've seen, you see? I hear you. Um, Michael, I can't think of a more inspiring way to end this uh, conversation. Really, really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. Um, listeners, you can learn more from Reverend Michael at michaelbeckwith.com and agapelive.com and something I just learned about his new, his app, Beckwith yes. Inspires. Yes. If they go to my website at michaelbeckwith.com, you can see where you can sign up for it. And as of today, we're, I'm putting up a meditation I did to help eliminate stress and anxiety. I, I, I did a, a film day, um, a meditation. It's going on the app probably today or tomorrow. Very good. And today is a week prior to this being on the air, so it'll already be there. Yes. Thank you again. And listeners, be sure to join me next week when we'll have another wise and wonderful guest. Meanwhile, you can find me at my website, philipgoldberg.com, sign up for my mailings, read my books, especially Spiritual Practice for Crazy Times, <laughs> and uh, peruse the archive of the, pod, the other podcast I co-host, uh, where we have a whole archive of wonderful guests, including a few years ago, Michael Bernard Beckwith. Meanwhile, be well, be strong, be safe. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. Thank you for listening. This is Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world.